Hello and good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all to our first annual summer virtual impact visit. Um, if you've done these in the past, uh, you probably know that we normally do these live, but due to uh, the way we have pivoted and the way that we've been doing business, we felt that doing them virtually um, would be real important and uh, offer everyone an opportunity to really see some of the great things that we've been doing over the past three months. Uh, first of all, I want to thank all of you for your continued support in our efforts and really uh, for being there, being there with us and for us over the last several months, um, really helping us navigate some of the most imagine, unimaginable um, things that, 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 that we never thought we'd be having to do. Um, I'm excited today. Uh, we're going to be talking about really one of the most powerful and impactful uh, community services and responses um, that the Y has done and um, throughout this time. And, and it's, it's what we've done with some of our most vulnerable members and our most vulnerable population that, that sometimes, unfortunately, uh, we have a tendency to overlook. Um, this is our senior outreach and what we've done with our seniors. Um, before before we closed down, you know, in, in, in the first of March, right, right when the pandemic was was coming upon us, uh, we realized that, you know, our seniors were going to be impacted by this um, far greater than some of our other some of our other members. And we started with about a staff of five people. And we just started cold calling our seniors and, you know, checking in just to find out how they were doing. Um, today, you know, that, that was that was mid-March. Um, today, we, we actually have a well-trained, well-oiled, fine machine of a staff of 30 people. But even more importantly, we have 35 volunteers that are helping us do these outreach calls every day. Uh, we've been able to train them in crisis intervention. Uh, we've trained them, them meaning our, our staff and our volunteers, on uh, community navigation and community resources. And, you know, to be quite frank, um, some of these calls that we've been making have been life-saving. And some of the stories that we hear from these uh, are just blow you away. Um, the other thing that we've realized through this is our seniors are, are some of our most loyal and valuable members that we have at the YMCA. They have stuck with us and for that we're grateful. Um, I'm going to turn this over but, but to, to a, some of our other staff, but before I do, I, I just want to tell, tell you a real quick story going back to, to how we started this. Um, Again, back in the early March, uh, I was having a conversation with one of our, our branch staff who was telling me that she had gotten a call um, from one of, the, one of our seniors, a 90 year old senior. And, and, and this was right when the virus was coming out. You know, it was this mystery um, plague that was, that was affecting nursing homes in our community at that time. Uh, but I, I was talking to one of our branch staff and uh, she was telling me about a phone call she received from a, a senior member, a 90 year old senior member who, who'd been with the Y um, almost all of her life, various Ys, um, but, but you know, over, over um, close to 70, 70, 70 years of her life, she had been part of the Y. And the senior member had called the staff person just saying, you know, I don't know what to do. You know, I, I, I don't want to miss coming to the Y this week. Um, you know, what should I do? Um, I, I'm really concerned about coming in and, and, you know, asking should she come in? And so the staff person talked to her and, and you know, reassured her that everything was going to be all right, uh, you know, gave her some advice, you know, and, and did a really good job of, of, of talking to the member. Uh, and again, at this time, we didn't know a whole lot. Um, but before they hung up, something profound, at least to me, profound happened. Um, 
the, the member, as they were hanging up, um, the member uh, talking to our, our staff member, voice got real shaky, was quivering, and she said, you know, our staff member said, you know, before I go, is there anything you can do? That member said to her, yes, there is something you can do. Would you mind coming to my house and sitting in my driveway and talking to me, calling me from your car in my driveway as I sit in front of my front door so I can see you and can we just talk? <laughs> Can we just talk? Can you come to my house and can we just talk? That member was scared. That member was lonely. That member was confused. That member was isolated. And she asked for her family to come and be with her in a time of need. The minute I heard that, I knew we had to do something. Um, and we put together this amazing team that I mentioned, you know, started with five. I now have over 70, 70 people. Um, we started with that one phone call. I, I count that as, as our initial call. Uh, we're now doing a thousand calls a week to people just like that member. One thing that this COVID virus has done has really made us look at the way we serve our seniors. And it's really made us realize how critical equity and access is to the why for our seniors. So we can make a difference. So we can be there for them when they're lonely and when they're isolated and when they're scared and when they're confused. I'm really proud of the team. Uh, they've done so much in these past three months. It's been remarkable. Um, and I just want to thank them. Uh, I'm now going to and turn it over to Sally Sundar, who's our program executive uh, for health integration, who's really been the catalyst behind this. And Sally's going to walk through in, in a little more detail uh, about some of the services and some of the things that we've been doing over the past three months. Um, and and I, I hope you like this. You're, you're really, uh, this has really been a powerful um, experience for all of us. Sally. Yes, thank you, Jeff. So we'll go ahead to the first slide. There we go, okay. Well, thank you everyone for joining and for learning more about our senior outreach efforts. I wanted to start the presentation by sharing a graphic showing our approach to whole person health at the YMCA. Um, and what that means is our approach to making sure that we can identify, acknowledge, and respond to the variety of needs and goals that every person we serve has related to their overall health and well being. So, for our senior members, this means um, caring for their physical health and supporting all aspects of healthy aging, ensuring supports are in place for positive emotional health, maintaining family and social relationships, finding purpose in everyday life, and providing opportunities to be an active part of their surrounding communities. So when the pandemic first started, we noticed uh, several trends locally and nationally that were concerning in terms of the potential impact these situations were going to have on our senior members health and on our ability to continue supporting their whole person health. So given that the coronavirus was and is most severe in its physical effects on older adults, the fact that this age group would bear the brunt of uh, much of the physical, social and emotional impact of the pandemic was unfortunately somewhat inevitable. Early on in the pandemic, we started to see changes to everyday life for many people, um, and in particular for our seniors, including the loss of social gathering spaces and opportunities in faith-based settings, in recreational settings like the Y, uh, changes to or loss of regular health routines, including changes to things like daily exercise, maintaining preferred diets, and managing chronic conditions like diabetes or chronic pain. Uh, reduced access to family and friends and social networks, increased difficulty accessing daily resources like groceries and medications and other supplies, 
uh, changes to the use of preventative health care and changes with in interactions with their primary care providers as they didn't feel safe going into their clinics. Uh, difficulty managing chronic conditions while stuck from home, stuck at home. Um, having less experience with some technology platforms like Zoom and FaceTime and Skype, which created difficulties in participating in virtual health care as well as uh, virtual social activities. Um, and reduce access to supportive resources for older adults who are acting as unpaid caregivers in their families. So nationally, fears about seniors dealing with uh, significantly increased levels of social isolation due to the pandemic quickly became a widespread talking point. And this is because data shows, public health data shows that older adults are even in the best of times at higher risk for both loneliness and social isolation. Um, and that's due to increased likelihood of living alone, of dealing with the loss of family and friends, limited physical mobility, and so on. So we knew that social isolation and loneliness, or we know that social isolation and loneliness can have as severe of an impact on a person's health as things like smoking and obesity. Um, it can increase risk of dementia, risk of depression, and overall risk for premature death. As recently as 2017, actually, the US Surgeon General declared loneliness and social isolation among older adults as a global epidemic that we as a country need to find new ways to address. So media outlets uh, quickly picked up on a lot of these talking points. Um, you can see here some of the headlines that were making waves in March and April. Um, and it likely helped in some ways to bring attention to the issue, but I think also probably increase some of the anxiety felt by this age group as they found themselves to be the topic of so many national headlines related to the pandemic. So as our YMCA observed these trends and started hearing from our own senior members, like Jeff mentioned in the beginning, about their concerns and about their needs early on in the pandemic, um, which were often related to struggles with losing access to regular exercise, uh, losing access to their social networks at the Y and, and other places, um, and not feeling safe to go out and get things like groceries. We started to form a response uh, that started small, but like Jeff said, it soon grew into a coordinated countywide effort. So we started by pulling a list of all of our senior members, which is close to around 10,000 people and created tracking logs by every by all of our for all of our 13 branches across the county uh, to track outreach and engagement with each person. This would allow us to have a record of who reached out to each of our senior members, what was discussed on those calls and what follow up steps were taken based on each person's unique needs or concerns. In order to ensure consistency and quality in those uh, outreach attempts across all of our branches, we developed an official staff training workshop, started with a handful of staff um, and eventually trained over 35 staff members. Um, and as we started growing and needing more support in these efforts, we ended up training over 30 volunteers as well, many of whom, the majority of whom are actually senior members themselves that received a call from one of our staff and wanted to help in this effort. We put a lot of time and effort into researching and curating community resource lists to help our staff and volunteers connect our members to resources both in and outside the YMCA. So we had already heard from our members that they were experiencing new challenges like accessing things like groceries. Um, but as the shutdown of different stores and agencies and institutions continued, um, and uncertainty grew, we began hearing new needs, ranging from needing help, understanding the governor's orders around social distancing and when and if they could leave the house, uh, help managing chronic conditions from home and changes to exercise routines and health routines, to help finding mental health and emotional support resources, which does, did include at times or has included at times um, giving someone access to crisis intervention resources in more severe situations. So we added to these community resource lists um, as our knowledge of new resources grew. Many of these resources were often neighborhood specific and they were popping up organically um, in response to the growing needs of the pandemic. And so we added to these lists to make sure that our, 
our staff and volunteers making calls to seniors would have access to the ongoing updates. We also created a public facing web page on our YMCA website that consolidated many of these resources in one place to be shared directly with our members and with our surrounding community. So because one of the most common requests we heard uh, from our members was needing help from the Y and staying active, staying healthy and staying connected during the shutdown, we created a virtual healthy YMCA or YMCA healthy living room. Um, and that's where we housed many of our virtual resources around health, including virtual exercise classes for active older adults, both live and pre-recorded, um, some virtual wellness and relaxation activities, weekly recipes, tips and blogs, and other things uh, to engage people in their health routines day to day from home. We also began sending a weekly uh, newsletter via email to all of our senior members where we consolidated a lot of these resources as well as other updates and information that might find that they might find helpful. Um, we included virtual social activities that our partner agencies were providing um, and other connections to external resources so that it would be easy to find all in one place. So next slide, there you go. Um, so you can see here a screenshot from our tracking log. It's a little hard to read. Um, but I just wanted to share, you know, the depth of detail that we were capturing with all of these outreach calls. Um, you can see in, in this screenshot that we reached out to each person multiple times, um, depending on, on what they requested in terms of ongoing support and outreach. And in the tracking log, we were not just tracking the person's name and information, but also every date that we reached out to them, the outcome of those outreach attempts, did the person answer the phone? Did we leave a voicemail? Was there another form of connection made? Um, if we didn't, if we weren't able to make contact, we noted, you know, if the, the number did not work or if there needed to be another um, pathway to reach that person in the future. We took detailed call notes about the members needs and necessary follow up steps. Um, and importantly, we asked them their preferred date of us calling again. So plenty of people said, thank you, this was this was great, this was really helpful, but I'm okay. I, I have a lot of support. Um, you don't need to call me again. Uh, but plenty of other people said, yeah, please call me again same time next week, or please call me again as soon as tomorrow. Um, so it really just depended on the person's unique situation, and we could track that in the spreadsheet in terms of what they needed for ongoing follow-up. We also tracked some quantitative data um, when we could around people's health challenges during COVID just to help us continue informing our own response and doing this work. So this list summarizes uh, just some of those resources that we were trying to make available or that we, we are working on making available to our members during this time, both on our website and through the outreach calls. Um, so you can see that we made an effort not only to cover topics like food access and COVID guidance, but also access to uh, information about the pandemic and other languages. We have plenty of people who English was not their first language and um, being able to access information from the State Department of Health or the County Department of Health in their own language made a big difference. Um, support using technological platforms like Zoom and Skype. Uh, for many people, their ability to engage with YMCA resources or healthcare resources or their children's school resources was difficult if they did not know how to access uh, uh, just say grandchildren's school resources, um, if they did not know how to access these systems. And so um, we made some tutorials on that available. Um, and again, support for unpaid family caregivers who were often seniors themselves supporting a spouse or loved one with dementia or another chronic condition. So just some screenshots here from our weekly newsletter to give you an idea of what we were sharing with people. You can see some different sections highlighting ways to stay connected to the community through virtual social events and engagement opportunities, new exercise classes for active older adults, uh, and recipes to try from home. Again, um, a few more screenshots highlighting the importance of mental health, trying to 
to bring some um, non-intimidating language about mental health into the conversation, knowing that many people are dealing with increased depression and anxiety during this pandemic. Um, we also have some information for caregivers, um, caregiver support, and other ways to take advantage of community connection while stuck at home. So these numbers are from last week, so they're probably slightly higher now, um, but you can see that since April 1st, we've made over 8,000 outreach attempts to over 7,000 senior members, and we've successfully connected with about half of those people in active conversations. Unfortunately, um, there has been some difficulty reaching people by phone, as many people these days do not answer phone numbers that they're not familiar with, which we understand. Um, and that did create some challenges, but we also left close to 3000 voicemails and often followed up with individual emails as well. So many people were able to get back to us once they received a voicemail or email, even if they did not answer the original phone call. So of the people we connected with, we were able to collect um, data from some of them regarding their, their main health challenges during COVID. And we found that it was actually a surprisingly small number of people who were experiencing difficulty with food and grocery access. Only about 1% of the people we talked to expressed that being a challenge um, versus about 5% expressed challenges with social isolation and loneliness, 7% with managing chronic conditions from home, and 11% with maintaining physical fitness and health routines during the pandemic. And these numbers are likely a little low given that we were not able to collect this data from many of the people we spoke with just due to time constraints and other priorities during the calls. So even though those, those data points might seem low, I, we, we really found that when somebody needed extra support, they really, really needed it. Um, so as one of our staff members said, many of the seniors we talked to were either just weathering the storm at home, hanging out, or they were actually really desperate. Uh, so we tried to choose a couple of quotes to illustrate where people were coming from in this respect. For example, while most people did not need help with grocery access, uh, those that did were often at a loss of what to do before they got a call from the YMCA. We had a couple key agencies we worked with to support grocery access uh, for those people that needed it, primarily the Mutual Aid Solidarity Network which offers an online request form that our staff could help people fill out um, and get the, the connections and support they needed to grocery access, including getting those groceries paid for if they could not afford it. Many others were experiencing more intense struggles due to their depression that had been exacerbated during the pandemic and the stay at home orders. We have an unfortunately high number of quotes and testimonials in which people are expressing how the call from the YMCA was often the only call they had received that week, um, and it was so appreciated due to the emotional struggles and the, the struggles with depression that they were dealing with during the shutdown. Something really important to note, though, is that despite all the national data and the headlines and the concerns over how seniors would fare in the COVID pandemic, one of our main takeaways as staff members from this work has been uh, just how resilient our senior members are. So people have made the best out of a situation with what they had, including the virtual exercise and engagement opportunities that the Y was bringing to them online. Uh, well, we heard over and over that people wish they could see their friends and their instructors and be at the YMCA in person. We saw them finding ways to make new routines and make new connection points. Um, there's one group who they met up with their classmates in the parking lot of the Y every week um, and just talked from their cars to make up for not being able to see each other in class. Um, we had groups that created virtual coffee chat clubs and knitting clubs. We had a group of East Side seniors that ended up engaging other senior members across the county in making thousands of cloth masks for YMCA child care staff and for health care system, uh, local health care systems. So uh, multiple staff actually involved in this in this outreach work have shared with me and shared with others how they felt like they got as much or more out of these calls as the people they were calling. Um, and they often left the call getting advice and encouragement from the Y members themselves. Uh, so missing community 
um, and seeing someone and seeing regular workout buddies and friends was by far uh, the most common challenge we heard from those we connected with. The outreach calls helped to fill some of that gap and ensure that people did know what connection points were still available virtually while the branches were closed. Um, we heard from many of our members, like those you see here, that the Y was often one of the only places that had reached out. And for some people, simply having someone to talk to outside of the house felt like a relief. Um, one member said it as a, you don't get in, you don't get outside in the world much right now. You get so bored, your call reminds me that I'm alive. Um, so moving forward, what will this look like? What will the response continue to look like? Uh, we know that the senior population will be one of the last populations to be able to re-enter social spaces as reopening of uh, the county occurs in different phases. And unfortunately, we recognize that resurgences of COVID are, are likely throughout the rest of 2020 and, and maybe beyond that will keep seniors and others stuck at home. So while many people have found ways to weather this pandemic over the last few months, we know that the longer the pandemic goes on or resurfaces that public health officials are expecting that the coping skills and the reactions to the, the physical and social and mental health impacts of the pandemic will probably worsen across all age groups, including seniors. So for that reason, we wanna make sure that our senior outreach uh, continues throughout 2020. And we're actually making a request form available on our website and through our newsletter that will allow members to actually request a call um, so they don't have to just rely on waiting for our staff to you know, get to that name on the list, but they can proactively request a call for themselves or for a family member. We're also working with our healthcare provider partners who are able to refer patients to us already through existing mechanisms that we have where they can refer to uh, the YMCA for programs like our diabetes prevention program we're going to open those channels for our healthcare providers to actually be able to refer their senior patients to us for social support during this time as well. We have a team working on Healthy Aging Week, um, which will be a week's worth of virtual activities that highlight all of the support services available to our seniors, even while our branches are closed or not operating at full capacity. The first day of Healthy Aging Week will focus on ensuring um, that our senior members know how to effectively use different technology platforms to be connected to our services as well as other services they might be trying to use in the community. Um, and the remaining days will have themes of staying healthy in mind, body, and spirit. We'll have some uh, external speakers, we'll have other senior service agencies leading some virtual activities, um, and this will just be a time to make sure that all of our uh, services to this population are being shared with our senior members in the broader community. We'll continue working with some of our external partners who have been a big part of this response, including faith-based institutions, the Alzheimer's Association, um, and others supporting, especially seniors with uh, memory loss conditions. And finally, we're going to launch a new model of engagement called Virtual Community Cafes. These will create virtual platforms to support peer-to-peer -peer connection uh, in semi-facilitated discussions around how people are dealing and coping with their reactions, their challenges, their hopes for the future in relation to COVID, as well as any other topic that comes up um, that has been meaningful to them um, as part of how their daily lives have changed you know, during this pandemic. So the cafes will also leverage some, some guest outside guest speakers, depending on the topic, and um, hopefully at minimum provide a way for people to feel like they're not alone in these challenges or these fears or these hopes that they wanna share with others. Um, and the CAFE approach will continue to expand to different languages, language groups, age groups, and topic areas as we understand what the community is really looking for in that area. So the experience of COVID um, has really expedited, as Jeff said, a lot of the work that we hope to do anyway when it comes to serving seniors in the YMCA of Greater Seattle. In response to the pandemic, um, we more quickly re-engaged and expanded our Healthy Aging Task Force, which is made up from staff across the association, as well as some senior member volunteers. 
And this task force helps our association form our organizational vision and strategy for serving the health, for meeting the health and social needs of seniors living in King County. Um, some branches have had robust senior programming in place for many years and others unfortunately haven't. So the task force will ensure that all branches in all corners of the county are able to offer programs and services that help our seniors thrive in and outside of the Y, both virtually and in person. Um, this brings us back again to where we started with our whole person health approach, uh, making the Y a hub of all, uh, meeting all the different needs for our older adult population. So from a physical perspective, that means making sure we're meeting the fitness and nutrition and chronic disease management needs. From an emotional perspective, mental health perspective, offering community cafes, our dementia support groups and more. From a social perspective, expanding access to the field trips and coffee chats and senior socials and many other activities that have been so embraced and are so missed during this pandemic. From a spiritual cultural perspective, uh, creating access to spiritual care for different faith groups as, as needed um, and to programs and events that are tailored to the cultural and uh, linguistic background of our different members. And finally, um, making sure that we are creating opportunities for people to volunteer, to be a part of their community and to influence their community and know how to access the resources out there in their communities that they may need. So with that, I will turn the stage back to Jeff so we can hear from some other panelists um, that have joined us today and have been involved in these efforts. Thanks, Sally. Thanks, Sally. I appreciate you doing that. Uh, that was good. I'm getting some, uh, I don't know if that's my name, but if everyone can mute you. Okay. So we're going to go into our Q&A uh, portion as we wrap things up, and I'm happy to have uh, Sally is going to be part of, of our panel. Um, and just a little background on Sally. She's been with us for almost four years. Uh, Sally does all of our kind of external partnerships uh, around clinical health and clinical care. Uh, she's really done some amazing stuff uh, to, to advance our uh, relationships in, in the healthcare world and partnership with, with, almost, with every major um, healthcare provider in the community. So Sally's going to be part of this panel. Um, we have Sage Silverman is also going to be on the panel to answer some of your questions. Um, Sage is a, a, a healthy living supervisor at West Seattle and Fauntleroy branch. Um, and she teaches a lot. She's an instructor, teaches a lot of, a lot of classes. But Sage has just kind of been the rock star in, in all of this. Um, Sage personally has made over 3,000 calls in, in the past uh, three months uh, to, to senior members um, spanning across four of our branches. So, um, you know, this is in addition to her, her real job. She's been able to do that. Um, we're also happy to have Diana Gay. Uh, Diana's a member, uh, a new member. She joined, joined the Kent branch when it opened. And um, after she's retired, after spending 30 years um, in, in um, the education, in special education. Uh, and Diane, Diana joined us uh, after she received a call from one of our staff, and she's been volunteering with us uh, ever since then. So I'm going to, we have some questions. Uh, I will read the questions and then ask uh, one of our panelists to uh, respond. Uh, and I'm sorry, I, we also have Kirsten Poma, who is, um, that's going to be part of the panel. And, and Kirsten is Sally's counterpart. She's our, um, our executive for healthy living um, and within the association. So great group of people here. Uh, we have a question from Mike. Mike, being, Mike says being a senior member but never contacted, I'm just wondering how you determine who to call. Um, I will let Sally address that. Um, sure. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks Mike. And 
I should say we have not made it through our entire list yet, so there are still plenty of people that we do need to call and it's quite possible that you will receive a call soon here um, because of uh, or because of that. So um, it's possible that you'll be getting a call in the next week or two. Um, it's also possible that somebody called and left a voicemail, but um, that's why we created the uh, request uh, form is so that we make sure that nobody falls through the cracks for any reason and that anybody who is looking for a call would be able to get one. So um, my guess is that you're probably you're coming up on our list here pretty soon. <coughs> and to answer your question on how we decided who to call, it was anybody who had a membership that was listed as a senior membership or a silver and fit membership. Great. Uh, our next question is anonymous, and this is a great question. What age did you consider quote senior for this effort? Kirsten, do you want to do you want to take that one? Yes. <clears throat> Hi, I'd be happy to. Um, to Sally's point, we pulled a search of all of our senior um, memberships and our senior memberships start at uh, 64 and go up from there. So that is the age um, group that we focused on. Um, we'd be happy to chat with anybody, though, again, who would be interested in, in talking with us. And so part of filling out our outreach form um, or, or getting that ready to be completed um, would allow for our members and our community participants to receive a phone call if they're interested in chatting with us. Great. And we have a question for Sally. Um, Sally, what are some of the learning opportunities that the team experienced when making these calls? Uh, this this could take an hour, but let's <laughs> let's let's uh, highlight some of the things we've learned through this. Yeah, I feel like I could answer that a lot of different ways. So hopefully, I'm going to address what the the person intended with that question. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Too much talking. Um, I do think that we again learned that um, for many of our seniors they had as much to teach us uh, and share with us as we did with them. And so it wasn't just a one way street, but we were really supporting each other um, as staff and volunteers and the members that we were calling. And, you know, I think that's how we continued building community during this time, which is really the goal of the YMCA in general. Um, so we also found that um, for a lot of people, it's the uncertainty of the pandemic that was creating the most anxiety or difficulty. And um, there's only so much any of us can do in, in a time like this to deal with that level of uncertainty, but we can definitely make spaces to come together to control what we can and to continue having access to the things that matter to us in the ways that we can. And so a lot of times we were getting those ideas directly from our members of, hey, it would be really helpful to have a social group that could just talk about how this is going once a week or it'd be really helpful to have some volunteer opportunities that make me feel like I'm able to give back you know to other people in the community that need help right now um, so a lot of the things that we made available or that we worked on were because people told us directly what they thought would be meaningful or helpful for them during this time which was great we again we learned as much from our members as hopefully we were able to provide to them Thank you. I have a question for Sage. Sage, what is the role of the Y in ensuring senior health moving forward? Thanks for that question. So I think the Y has a unique opportunity continue, to continue to do this work outside of just the four walls of our facility and really meet seniors where they're at. So we know that until there's reliable testing resources, effective treatments, or a vaccine, that COVID will be around for some time and that there's going to be resurgences of this disease. So we should be continuing to grow our volunteer base to ensure that isolated seniors have a regular phone interaction, um, or we can help facilitate connecting members to each other so that they can create their own phone call friends and reconnect with members that they knew previously at the branches. Um, we can continue to engage our community members and help keep them connected with our virtual potlucks, community cafes, and online workouts. Um, our senior members are definitely hoping that these calls continue in the future 
and the outreach program is showing a level of care that they haven't experienced from other community centers and gyms before, and they've definitely expressed that to us. Great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Diana, why did you want to start volunteering after you got your, your, your phone call? What inspired you to do that? I hope Diana can hear us. If, if she cannot, I do have um, some thoughts from Diana that I'd love to share on her behalf. So please just let me know. I don't know, she may be muted. Yeah, I, I mean, Diana has really stepped up. Why don't, why don't you just mention that, um, Sally? Yeah, I think um, unfortunately there's been some connection difficulties for Diana this morning, but she gathered some great thoughts for us and I'd love to share that on her behalf. Um, so she shared with us that after she got a call from Marissa, um, she felt like she could really help with doing this same type of outreach and she was beginning to feel a bit useless sitting at home. So having a volunteer activity added a, a great new dimension to, uh, to her daily life. Um, so many of the people that she talks with are doing okay overall, but they're missing the things that the Y provided for them. And the biggest problem she sees is people missing the in-person social contact, um, much of what they got while going to the Y. Um, and all they also miss uh, ways to deal with chronic health conditions like using the pool and the exercise machines that helped them so much in the past. Um, she talked to some people that are really busy with caregiving activities and don't have too much time to think about themselves. Um, and she will say that having talked to seniors who live in the Kent area like herself, she learned so much about her new community and from the people who have lived there, lived there longer than she has. Um, and most people are just really happy to get a call and they ask her to keep calling and to have further conversations and they're just glad to know the why is thinking about them and they have another person to chat with. So um, anyway, thank you, Diana, for sharing those thoughts with us. Yes. Hi, this is Diana. Oh, here we go. Hey, Diana. I just, am I connected now? <laughs> we hear you. Yes. Oh, okay. Thank you, Sally, for um, eloquently saying what I had written down, and I'm just fine to um, continue to listen. Great. I, we can't say enough about the importance of peer, the, the peer group either. Um, we have an anonymous question. This is another great question. Do we have any um, grief groups for widows or widowers? Um, Sally, do you want to you want to do that one? I'll chime in and see if anyone else, including Kirsten, knows about that. I I do know that some branches have had those in the past, and they've been they you know they've been meaningful for many of our members. And so I would say that. If that was of interest, please do reach out to one of us. We'll be sharing contact information after this webinar, and we can definitely see based on where the person is located, um, what type of support we can make available. Right now it would be you know, virtual, a virtual group, um, but we have had in-person and virtual groups who have met on that topic in the past. Yeah, and we could add that to our, our uh, cafe, a topic for one of our cafes. Yeah, no, that's a good idea. Yeah, another next group is, I'm, I'm sorry, next question is from an anonymous person. How does one volunteer? I am, a, I am a retired educator and I miss helping others. Well, we are about to give you an opportunity. <laughs> uh, Kirsten, you wanna, you wanna take that one? I, I'd be happy to. And I think we're gonna probably mention um, throughout the rest of this conversation, but we do have a, a couple of, uh, of our staff members who've been really instrumental in our Healthy Aging Task Force, um, who have really led our efforts uh, at the association with their work with our seniors. One is Heather Steele, she works out of our North Shore branch, and then Sherry Pamer, who works out of our Bellevue branch. Um, and Heather Steele will be um, the contact person who will be helping kind of organize anybody who's in 
interested in volunteering um, in this capacity. We have some training that we provide and uh, some, some information. So we'll make sure to provide her contact information uh, either through this particular presentation or afterwards in the in the slides that we send out and the recording that we send. Great. Uh, I have another one for Diana. Uh, Diana, as a volunteer, um, what did you learn from this experience that you did not know? And how have these changed? How does this change the way you see the impact of volunteering? Um, hmm. Well, I've actually learned a few things about Kent. Um, I've only lived here uh, three years, so people are telling me different things about it. Um, I learned about a great new online game that one of the other uh, seniors shared with me that she plays a lot. So these little games actually keep us uh, occupied during boring moments of the day. Um, I've learned that the Y is staffed by some really vibrant young women, mostly that I've seen and worked with, and that are extremely caring and so good at what they do. And we are blessed to have them. Great. Thank you so much. Kirsten, what ways are you looking to expand the outreach calls in the next few weeks? Well, I think there's been a few things that have mentioned here. Thanks for that question. Uh, a lot of um, what I'm seeing along the Q and A um, questions that are coming through, I can see that there are some opportunities that we have to really engage with our community cafes. Um, I think Sage uh, spoke very eloquently about this, and you know, being able to look at other opportunities to reach out to our seniors um, beyond just phone calls. I think we have some, you know, as we begin to see how things change in our world, that will inform uh, some of the ways that we can reach out to our seniors. We may look to be able to create some, you know, in branch but socially distant um, coffee chats potentially that will uh, take care of some of these opportunities for people to be in community with each other. Um, but also learning from our from our senior members and these phone calls and these, you know, uh, contact forms that we receive and really trying to learn what else um, we can do. And, and trying to do it. Great. Sage, um, this is from an uh, anonymous, but what, what can we do to engage the seniors in our own lives who are socially distancing? Another great question. Yeah, that is a great question. I really think it's as simple as just reaching out and showing care in whatever capacity you have. So whether that is reaching out by phone, sending a card in the mail. Um, if they're on email and using technology, reaching out to them on Facebook or an email. Um, if you live near them, if you can drive and be in the driveway and or park on the street and just give a wave and a smile, I think it's as simple as, as those actions, um, whatever works best for, for the two of you. Great. And then uh, Melissa's posted, um, how to how to sign up to volunteer here. Uh, we have a question from Lynn. Is there any opportunity for high school students to volunteer? And I have two high school students and I would love for them to volunteer as well. But uh, yes, there is. I'll answer this. Um, uh, they, they would need to be trained and um, we would love to have high school volunteers. I mean, the impact on this uh, goes both ways. It, it's it's the um, it's the senior, but it's also the people making the call. So um, if we can follow up with that question, uh, and we can get them registered uh, and trained. Uh, and I'll just add to that really quickly, Jeff. Um, we do have some high school volunteers and. Right. They, they're sort of the, they were the exception to the rule at first because the original requirement was being 18 or older, but we had some high schoolers interested and they've um, done a great job. And I think there's definitely some great energy there. So uh, absolutely, this is something that we can, we can discuss um, and make some plans around moving forward. Yep. Yeah, they, they would just go through our volunteer process, which um, we can help with that. 
Uh, okay, have another anonymous one. Uh, is there a way that community members can get involved to help offer services to seniors or contribute to the outreach? Um, I, I'll open that one up to, to any one of you guys. Um, I think all three of you may have something to offer. Um, uh, so is the question going beyond just doing the phone calls, but other types of support? Other, yeah, help with other services or contribute to the outreach. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, something that comes to mind for me is that if people know that there's a willing community to help with small or large tasks during this time that they might be struggling with, whether that's you know, picking something up from a store or fixing something in the home or what have you. Um, I think it could actually be a really great idea to start kind of collecting a pool of people that would be willing to help out those that don't know who else to call or who else to reach out to during this time when it when it goes beyond social support. Um, so I think that's one idea that comes to mind is um, that would really depend on on the volunteer and what where they live and what capacities they have to support seniors beyond just the senior outreach calls. I don't know if anyone else wants to add to that. Oh, great, thanks. OK, this is a long question from an anonymous person. This is interesting. I am based in the UK. And one of the key issues that we have discussed in our team is the issue of othering, quote, the media here often refers to older people negatively, referred to as burden, and they are treated as an homogenous group. As such, sympathy for having to shield, for having to shield from is low. I would be interested if there is a similar negative media bias here in the US. Ooh. Um, Sally. <laughs> I can start and I'm happy to have yeah. others join in. I will not speak for the media because I don't feel I don't feel confident in answering the media bias. I do think though that like I showed in earlier slides that we saw so many headlines circulating and national data circulating around this fear that our older adult population would just really dramatically suffer during the pandemic, not just because they were at highest risk for contracting the virus and having a severe form of the virus, but also because um, of issues around social isolation and loneliness. And all of those fears were warranted and, and had some truth behind them. But I hope that something we communicated through this presentation is that just because you're over a certain age doesn't mean you are necessarily in a high risk zone. It doesn't mean that you consider yourself to be at a higher risk in in certain respects than others. Um, there's such a range of at all ages of how people feel and what their self efficacy and confidence level is. And, um, you know, we we are here to support you no matter where you're coming from. And sometimes that was as simple as a nice conversation that we both um, really enjoy and, and call it a day. And we just know that we we built some community during that moment and it was a good connection. And sometimes it was more in depth that somebody really needed our help with with certain issues and we were able to help them. Um, but I would not in any way want people to think that the YMCA or others are looking at our seniors as homogenous. We know that they're um, that we are dealing with a very diverse population and that everybody's comes from a different background and a different set of needs. And like I said, um, we learned as much and benefited as much from these phone calls as staff that uh, hopefully that our members benefited from. So um, I, I hear what you're saying. I think that unfortunately that is a common issue we see um, in terms of how we talk about our senior population, but I hope that we can sort of change that narrative through work like this and the relationships that we're building. And, yeah, and, and I would just add, you know, we, we put a stake in the ground that um, equity and access for all is, 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 you know, what we're going to do. And, you know, we want to ensure, regardless of who it is, that they have the same opportunities and same um, 
access of, of all of our members. So that includes seniors, and we surely are not going to look at them as a burden to us. They're, they're an asset to us. All right, we have one more question. Um, what do you do for those who are non-English speakers? Is there a list of languages you need? Um, Sage, can you can you talk about what we've done in recruitment of of some volunteers and and other things around non-English speaking speakers? I might actually um, redirect that question to Sally or Kirsten, if that's all right. Sure. I, I can jump in on that one. Um, we do have a Spanish speaking staff member who's been really involved in this outreach work. Um, and we do have a couple other part time staff that we can rely on for some specific languages. But in general, it's something that we could use a lot more volunteers around um, in terms of having other uh, languages represented. So I think if anyone on the call is is bilingual or it does speak languages other than English and is interested in supporting this outreach, we would absolutely be interested in um, being able to expand beyond just English and Spanish in this outreach effort um, because we do have a very diverse membership base and we know that there's people, um, especially in the uh, Mandarin and Cantonese population that we've struggled to be able to do outreach to as much as we'd like to. Great. OK, we're going to um, we're going to wrap things up. Um, first, I, I, you know, again, I want to thank everyone for joining us uh, and being a part of this. Um, they, we will be doing multiple um, uh, virtual events throughout the summer and, and encourage you to to be involved in those. Um, we will be sending an email uh, with a, a brief survey to everyone who participated today. Uh, and in that email, it will include the questions uh, with answers that, that didn't get to be answered. So look forward for that um, to come. And you know, once again, we just want to thank all of you for your support and your ongoing support in our efforts. And you know, we really look forward to continuing not only our senior calls, but, but all of our community response and, and also look forward to getting back to serve our community uh, you know, the, the way the way we were uh, prior to COVID uh, and, and continuing to work together with, with all of our volunteers. Um, so thank you all so much.